Hi, I'm Chris. And I'm Kelsey. And this is World's Worst Deaths. On this show, my friend Kelsey and I will discuss all the terrible and strange ways you can die. There's so many good still water deaths. We'll discover more on exactly what makes those strange deaths so terrible. Do, do your organs burst? Burst? That I don't know. Be. And finally, we'll decide on which death is in fact the world's worst. Today's topic is water. Kelsey, what is the world's worst way to die from water. I don't know that just straight up drowning is even one of the worst ways to die. I have some other alternatives that I have been thinking about that are way scarier than just drowning. What is scarier than drowning? The worst water death is H2O poisoning. The hold your we for we death. This happened 15 years ago and I'm still thinking about it. It spread on the news at school because this was just a crazy story that this poor woman, Jennifer Strange, died after participating in the water drinking contest and her family won $16.5 million awarded by a California jury. This poor woman in her late twenties, mother of three, probably would not be able to afford such a nice gaming system on her own. That's what she was doing this for, for her kids, for her baby. So you know this woman was going in here like, I, as a woman, have trained my whole life for this. We are always told to just hold it. We are bred from birth to wait in astronomically long lines to use the restroom. We are just trained to just cinch the bladder and just hold it in. So I can see how she really pushed herself and she really thought that she could do this. I'm sure she had the heart of a champion. Yeah, heart of a champion, bladder of just a human being, a woman of flesh and blood. Do, do your organs burst? Burst? That I don't know. I'm sure that it is possible. I'm sure you could pump someone up with a hose. Oh, maybe that's one way. Maybe that's- Pump someone <laughs> up with a hose until they explode. Death by hose. Another episode for another day. Let's get sad. Let's get sad, Let's shall get we? Let's get sad. At the time of the incident, Laura Rios, one of Strange's co-workers at the Radiological Associates of Sacramento said that Strange said to one of our supervisors that she was on her way home and her head was hurting her real bad. She was crying and that was the last anyone had heard from her. Oh my so God. that was after the contest. And then she was found dead hours after that. 10 people at the radio station got fired. Maybe more should have happened. Gosh, if that's really all that happened, that radio station, uh, they got off late, I think. So I'll give you that. That is absolutely a terrible, horrible, awful way to die. Is yeah. it the worst though? I don't know, what do you think? Riptides terrify me. Wait, riptides are really scary. I don't, I don't know if that's like the that worst either. way to die. Well, I think it's the idea, again, like context is everything, right? You're out at the beach, you're having a nice time, you're just chilling, you go for a little swim, and then all of a sudden you're fighting for your life and you absolutely panic. I have heard when you drown because of the lack of oxygen in your brain that it's generally kind of a peaceful way to die. But up until then, until that point that you lose absolute awareness and consciousness, it's probably really terrifying and scary. That might be the worst. I don't know. I'm still saying though that drinking too much water because have you ever like had to pee so bad and you couldn't? Yes. Shall we get into suffering? Shall we get into that? Oh, there's more to get into. Yeah, yeah let's, let's dig right into the suffering. So what exactly is H2O or water poisoning? You know, I thought I was being really scientific, like hydrogen dioxide, you know, a hydrogen and two oxygens together. That is water. Did we know this? We do now. This study about fatal water intoxication talks about how water intoxication can occur in a variety of different settings, but there's not a lot of medical studies and literature about it. You know, we're so worried about dehydration, nobody is thinking about overhydration. So the condition goes unrecognized a lot of the time. Early symptoms of having way too much water, like that can be seen outwardly, include confusion, disorientation, extreme nausea and vomiting, but also changes in mental state and psychotic symptoms. The crying and feeling a little like unstable in your emotion, totally normal for water poisoning. And early detection is crucial to prevent severe hyponatremia, which can lead to seizures, coma, and bada boom, death. 
That's the big one. So, this has happened before in a 64 year old woman with a known history of mitral valve disease, but no other relevant past history. And on the evening before her death, she began compulsively drinking water in vast quantities between 30 and 40 glasses, apparently, and then started vomiting in between. She became hysterical, distressed, and started shouting that she still had not drunk enough water. She declined any medical attention and continued to drink water after she went to bed. And then she fell asleep and died sometime later. Wow. But they did a post-mortem examination on her. There were cut surfaces on her lungs that were exuding frothy pink fluid. That doesn't sound great. That sounds like too much water where there shouldn't be. And the intra-abdominal organs were generally wet. Just generally. Generally, I don't think that the intra-abdominal organs are supposed to be generally wet. Moist, it, like, is okay because yes, human beings, we are over 70% water. We are beings of water. There is fluid inside, but it's not wet per se. You know what I mean? I can't imagine just sloshing around, right? You must feel that as you move around. I know, I know. You're just like a huge balloon just carrying just gallons of water. That sounds horrible. We all have that one hydro homie who just cannot keep their, their mitts off of that next glass of water. Dude, this episode <laughs> goes out to the hydro homies. The most common of these mental illnesses that might cause such intense water intoxication is called psychogenic polydipsia, which can be associated as its own mental illness or with others or as a mental handicap. And this condition has also been seen in young army recruits of good health who developed hyponatremia after apparent overhydration following heat related injuries. So out of fear of dehydration, they have overhydrated and hurt themselves, which is really tragic. That seems like a, the most reasonable way for this to happen though. An overcorrection of trying to get water back into your system. Because that, that at least has some internal logic to it, I think. Agreed. Mm -hmm. And then of course, again, let's get a little bit sad again, forced water intoxication is a recognized form of child abuse, which commonly leads to brain damage and is sometimes fatal. As sad as the hold your wee for wee story is, it is a sobering reminder, I think, that you really should not be drinking ridiculous amounts of water, not getting enough electrolytes and salt, and then not going to the bathroom. It's how you get organ failure, and you can do it with just water. <laughs> the human body is so fragile. We are just water balloons filled with chunky soup and we fall apart so easily. <laughs> yeah, basically. It's so important to do the right things, right? There's a new study that came out that shows that the more hydrated you are, the better you look, the sexier your skin is, the less likely you are to die earlier or to develop diseases like Alzheimer's and heart disease and all of this stuff that kills Americans. If you stay hydrated enough, so I don't want anyone to think that I'm not a hydro homie. We are pro hydro homie here, just to be yeah, clear. Absolutely. But that's why I thought this death was so interesting and why it's the absolute worst. Because as a big fan of water and drinking water, I wanted to ask why is this the absolute worst death? Water is so enjoyable and refreshing. It's really ironic to have delicious, cold, wonderful, versatile water turn on you in such a way. This is a really slow physical death. You know, I think we talked earlier about how drowning is like euphoric, right? And there is no euphoria in this. I think that this is this slow, torturous, painful, just tragic sort of death that could be really easily prevented. And that's what makes it the world's worst water death. What if you had such a high pressure of water concentrated onto one part of your body that it just like slices right through you? They do have oh these- Oh my god. I know. They have these tools in certain industrial environments uh, called water jet cutters. And there's no way someone hasn't mauled themselves using the water cutter machine. Surely 
lost a limb and bled out. Yeah. Which, yeah, that is technically death by water. It'd be like a wet lightsaber, just cutting right through you. Yeah, like when you watch episodes of Jackass and they get the fire hose involved and they're just like getting absolutely pummeled. And then you think about that times. Yeah, but this Johnny ever. Knoxville just being Darth Mauled in half by the fire department. Yeah, that's pretty frightening. I think that would be a pretty painless death if it's Maybe. truly the, like the lightsaber of water it, it would wouldn't cauterize cool. though is it hot is it steamy i could go for that it must be high friction if it's high pressure so yeah, maybe it does that. cauterize it steams i don't know to find out honestly that's giving me more desirable death energy now let me tell you everything you've never wanted to know about water jet cutters they are an industrial tool used to cut hard materials with extremely high pressure jets of water they are a well hydrated hydro homey version of the laser cutter. They have many uses, they're found everywhere, they are a friend to all in the industries, and they are unstoppable with water. We're talking 60,000 PSI to just cut things like an anvil in half. Check out this clip from Water Jet Channel. Now, I understand so far it sounds like I am pro water jet cutter. Yeah, you called it a friend. Why would you do well, that? Well, a friend to all in the industries. Now, I'm oh. not in the industries. Uh, as much as I love that water jet channel on YouTube, it did implant several new fears. There's so many good still water deaths. They say that, like, Lucy, the Australopithecus, drowned in a bog. There's so many people who drowned in bogs or, like, in wells, perhaps. Gatsby drowned in his pool. Gatsby be drowned in his pool. Yeah, that's really sad too, just context alone. Yeah. Like, that should be something to be considered too. How metaphorical is your is your water death? Yeah, how poetic. <laughs> I want to know what kind of damage that does to flesh. Is it clean? And bone. That absolutely cuts up? through bone. Okay, or maybe not. Right. Well, we're going to find out. What could go wrong? Well, a lot, as it turns out. For example, my precious hot dog fingers. What's gonna happen to them if I have the water jet cutter on and I'm just carelessly swiping my hot dog fingers all over the place? Well, our friends <laughs> over at Water Jet Channel had the same question and this is what they found. Horrible, horrible news. Cuts right through it like tissue paper. It's nothing. I hate anything that has to do with like bone skin hands like i love jewels and rings and like anything that is just like uh an industrial finger injury haunts me yeah that's disgusting i don't i don't, I don't want to cut my finger in half so i want to move away from the soft tissue let's move into the hard tissue, the bone of the matter. For example, the femur, as we call it in the biz, the good bone. Yeah, they do. Now the femur is the strongest bone in the body. It's able to withstand up to 1700 PSI before being cut clean in half. However, these machines, look at this, get up to 60,000 PSI. This one, this one in the corner here, Hyperjet, 94,000 PSI. I don't know what you would need the Hyperjet for to cut clean through the earth, I guess. I don't know. I mean, yeah, serious materials, friend of the industry, you said so yourself. So at the end of the day, it's just cutting like any other laceration. That's kind of boring. How could this world's worst death be the absolute world's worst death? by water. And I think I have a solution of how exactly it could get worse. Imagine this, dear reader. You're hosting a hot tub party. Everyone's loving it. The sun is setting. Uncle Jeff is rocking the saxophone for some reason. Doesn't matter. He sounds great. The vibes are immaculate. But it needs just one thing to take it to the next level. And just like Brian Eno, you're all about those warm jets. Only these jets don't offer multi-directional massages. No, no, no. They shish kebab your body in a 60,000 PSI barrage of water spears, rendering you into a soggy mess of something vaguely resembling Swiss cheese. Uncle Jeff is still, all the while, just wailing away <laughs> on that saxophone. And I think all of that together in that context absolutely makes a water jet cutter death the world's worst death by water. Okay, but why is the hot tub this powerful? It, it's party time. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, still kind of sounds like the world's best death to me. Okay, so we've come all this way. I think we've learned a lot about water and how it can, it can really just ruin your day without even beginning to drown you. I mean, do we know? Do we know which one is the absolute worst? I, I think I am going to vote for yours. Death by water poisoning, because 
I think about how there's nothing more refreshing than a cool glass of water when you just really want one. You really need a cool glass of water. It's the best thing in the world. And for that to turn around and kill you terrifies me. Absolutely. Thank you. Let's not forget about the brutality of poisoning. I don't think I emphasize that enough. This is a form of toxication and poisoning. That alone, that is absolutely horrible. That is tragic. That is killer. That is Joffrey Game of Thrones eyes bugging out. And that can happen with water. Joffrey, number one hydro Joffrey. homie. Joffrey, a hydro <laughs> homie. Water intoxication, an unexpected sleeper hit. So your vote is, is, is water intoxication as well? I think so, because the scene that you described sounds kind of awesome. If I have to be put out of my misery, I would love to be sliced up in a hot tub with all the party girls and all the friends. Let's just say I'm on the job and I accidentally lose a limb. I, I think that I think that would be an okay way to just bleed out in a couple of minutes. In a jacuzzi? I mean, yeah, like the jacuzzi would be great, yes. That's my version of Midsummer. When I'm 77, baby, just cut off my arm and stick me in the hot tub. There you go, sous vide. Yeah. All right, well that does it here for us today. We have learned so many terrifying things, but next time we are going to be back with more deaths and more answers to unravel. Yes, we're gonna keep hunting for the world's worst death. So please come with us on that journey. It's gonna be really scary and really traumatizing. I can't wait. Thank you so much for watching. See you next time. Hi, I'm Chris. And I'm Kelsey. And this is World's Worst Deaths. Today's topic is fungus. So Kelsey, what are the world's worst ways to die from fungus? We're all thinking about deadly fungus right now. The nation is absolutely gripped by the riveting drama, The Last of Us. Mm -hmm. The idea that there is a real life fungus out there with the ability to do any kind of mind control is absolutely horrific. Cordyceps, the zombie virus, right? Ophiocordyceps unilateralis, which is also known as just, as we've been calling it, cordyceps or the zombie ant fungus. Like other parasites, the cordyceps fungus drains its host completely of nutrients, just sucking up all that good body juice before putting spores back into the body that will let the fungus reproduce. Then the, the mind of the insect is compelled to seek height and remain there before it expels the spores, infecting other nearby insects, probably its own colony in the process. So I that's, hate all of this. I mean, that's horrible, right? Like there's nothing pleasant about that. So that's just nature. That's just a string of evolution deciding that's the best case scenario for all parties involved. Exactly. Yes, this is natural selection in progress. And so in the show, when we see all those wonderful, terrifying special effects of just like little fungal tendrils coming out of every orifice, that is very like what happens to these poor ants and spiders and wasps. Ugh, I hate that. I hate that a lot. We live with fungus. We love fungus. Human beings have been taking psilocybin for many, many years and poisoning themselves just to go on a magical little trip. We put fungus in our bread and in our food, which is coincidentally in the show, how the disease spreads is the food supply, which is probably how any large scale pandemic would spread. That's how I'm gonna get it. I love to eat bread. You love to eat bread? Yeah. Like what is your what is your relationship with with mushrooms in general? Are you a mushroom fan? Sure. I like I like some some chicken marsala every now and then. Yeah, I love a good I love a good uh, uh, tuna noodle casserole with the mushroom soup. Love mm -hmm. that. I like wine. That's fermented from yeast. It's a type of fungus. Um, I take medicine, antibiotics adapted from fungi. See, that's right. Let's get into antibiotics then. Why are fungal diseases in general so scary? There are 
thousands, thousands of deaths every year attributed to fungal disease. In 2021 alone, an estimated 7,199 deaths occurred. That was just 2021. That's insane. Yeah, right? They're really, really hard to cure. When I was doing a little bit of deeper digging as the stalwart and absolutely unshakable reporter that I am, I saw this really deadly new fungal disease called C. auris, and I wanted to know more about it. I wanted to find out where did this thing come from, and <laughs> it was first identified in Japan. While well, they have found out that many cases of C. auris have been resistant to antifungals, which is what they're trying to use to treat this crap, there were 10 cases that were identified that were resistant even to their hardest medicines, which are called echinocandins. I'm a doctor, no I'm not. And those are the first line treatments of an infection against this. So basically, I'm just trying to terrify you to let you know there is no cure. We have stuff we can do for people that come down with C. auris, but your odds are not looking great. There were some other cases that also happened in 2017 and 2018 in New York City, and they developed the same resistance. These things that are happening happening in major cities, yeah, there's no cure for them. How do people get this? They don't know where it comes from, which is also what's alarming. If you come in contact with Candida auris, you are, you know, not 100% guaranteed to get it. It mainly affects patients who already have medical problems and definitely people who have had frequent hospital stays or even live in nursing homes. Also, uh, Last of Us being spot on, the first zombie we see, what, she's an older woman, right? So the idea that the elderly and the weakened are much more susceptible to fungal infections, very spot on, very true. If you're receiving lots of antibiotics already, if you have a lot of tubes going into your body, breathing tubes, catheters, all of that. This is definitely not good if you're already a sick person. If you come into contact with someone who has it, C. auris can continue to live on the skin. So it's really, really easily spreadable. This is just very, very gross. Do like, you know how long it can survive outside of the host body? When they found the spores for this in a hospital, they had to hydrogen peroxide spray that room for a whole week. They were still finding these spores living days and days after this man had died. These things are really tough to kill. I don't know how I feel about something that small being that much more resilient than me. Remember COVID? Remember COVID, Chris? This is giving me like COVID vibes. Like there are mushrooms out there that could absolutely cause a whole ass pandemic. The head of the fungal branch at the CDC, my guy, Dr. Tom Chiller, has described C. auris as a creature from the Black Lagoon that has bubbled up and now it's everywhere. They are struggling to find treatments to stop the spread. This is really alarming. Dr. Chiller needs a different name because I am stressed. This is really sad actually. A lot of people who are at the greatest risk for C. auris are often like HIV and AIDS patients or preterm infants to the elderly. But that's not to say that it can't just kill just about anyone. No, um, because again, in, it can always evolve and become more resilient. The more human specimens it infects, the more resilient to humans it becomes. Exactly. It just, it sounds really unpleasant. It has caused bloodstream infections, wound infections, ear infections. Basically, it can just lower your immune system and then you're open to all infections, baby. Like, it just wrecks you. Mm. It just wrecks you. But something else that always worries me about fungi too is how quickly they grow. The, the lawn will be freshly mowed and then the next morning the grass will still be short and dewy and all the mushrooms are just towering over the grass overnight. That freaks Wait, me out. that is true. Yes. Like these things can happen so fast, which is what makes it so scary. It may sound kind of boring, right? Like, oh, the spores, they continue to live on in medical equipment and whatever. But look, I had to spend a, a decent amount of time this last uh, December in a hospital for a family member. And it is horrifying to think of all of the things that live in hospitals. And we go there to get care. 
We go there to get better. And there's MRSA. There's the last patient who died in here was just letting his mushroom spores be everywhere. That is horrifying. Ugh. And it may sound boring because there's not face eating zombies with like mushroom spores coming out of their ears all moving together and crap. Like, yeah. But the mushroom it, spores it, coming out of the ears is exactly what scares me about how quickly fungi grows. If you have a fungus in your skull before it even turns you into a z brain zombie, it just outgrows your skull's ability to contain it. And yes, your head just yes. bursts open. Such a not nice way to die. So I, 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 I do think I agree. Withering away in a, in a hospital room, infecting the hospital further. Sounds like the world's worst way to die from a fungus. Like, look, cordyceps, very scary, very freaky, concerning, not an impossible thing that could happen to us. But if you are visiting a loved one in a hospital, see Oris. That's what you want to look out for, folks. I don't know if this has anything to do with how resilient uh, fungal infections are, but fungi, the cell walls have uh, chitin in them. So I wonder if the chitin in a fungal cell is what helps help it retain its strength and help helps it uh, defend itself from any would-be uh, antifungal regimen. What is chitin? Chitin is the primary component of cell walls found in fungi, the exoskeletons of anthropods like crustaceans and even insects, cephalopod beaks, and mollusks, it is everywhere. It is basically nature's Kevlar armor, okay? And I gotta stop thinking about how quickly mushrooms grow, right? You mow the lawn, they're gone. The next morning, they're three feet high and taking over the dog. It's insane and I, it scares me. I do not like it at all. So I was thinking about chitin materials and the last of us, the fungus overtakes mankind and enjoys our soft, chitinless flesh. What then, Kelsey? What then? I don't know. I don't know. I mean, like, I want to know what that feels like. I'm well, sure I have it... an idea because there's only one solution. Chitin is a major byproduct of our seafood industry. So I propose we gather all those shells, process them into hard mecha-like armor and build giant crab robots. That's right. Chitin Crab Mecca's the savior of mankind. I have here a couple of uh, conceptual images, one from an anime, and the other I think is Despicable Me. Oh, so people are already thinking about this. Like, you're behind. At least two people have thought about this before. <laughs> They're like, you know what? Yeah, why aren't there more crab armors out there? We could use that. Well, I say two people. I did some scouring and I did find this third image, this beautiful bipedal crab mecha, our final hope, the fighting chitin titan, as I've lovingly name, named him. The final hope is this is like a spoiler for the series finale. Yes, of yes. HBO, HBO wishes it could pull this off. Uh, yeah, they're going to go <laughs> off the tracks. They're like, forget the game. We've got a better idea. That's right. And that's the IRL apocalypse versus these very, very strong mushrooms. You see here artists surrendering of what the world's worst death from fungus might look like. It's chitin versus chitin. Who wins? No one. We all lose, I think. Mm. I do think this is where we die. I do think this is where the world's worst death happens. But speaking of very large mecha battles for the fate of mankind, I have not seen the end of Evangelion, but I'm sure it works out just fine for everyone involved. <laughs> yeah, that's the happiest ending anime I've ever seen. It's a delight and you should definitely check it out. Hopefully there are crab mechas. <laughs> so my Man. conclusion, Death Man. by Chitin is indeed mighty frightening. There are tons of things out there that we have no solutions for. At least your story had a solution, I think. Yeah, that, that is much more alarming. Yes. You know, I think that a 12 story tall crab man fighting mushroom spore zombies, I'd watch that. So would I. So would I. Well, Kelsey, all of that information is great, but I think we need to decide now which is the world's worst way to die from fungus. Hmm. I tried to find the real last of us disease, mm -hmm. right? And so cordyceps, that's not happening to human beings right now yeah, yet. Yeah. <laughs> yet, yet. Human beings, we run pretty hot, right? You know, 98.5. 
or whatever. And most organisms, their proteins can't survive in our bodies. You know, that's how human beings, that's how we've evolved to live in this scary disease riddled world. But there are species of fungus that are able to withstand higher temperatures and that can infect humans. And climate change is letting those fungi evolve to withstand those higher temperatures. While it is not necessarily likely in the minds of scientists, it is absolutely possible that at some point a fungus with mind control capabilities could withstand and live inside a human body. Since mine was just a little, you know, run of the mill, basically fungus will make you sick and kill you. And granted that should be terrifying, but chitin is keeping me up at night, like what you said. Mm. I think I'm gonna have to go the other way. I think yours is a little bit more frightening. The idea of going to a hospital and depending on a hospital to make me better and then just coming away with this incurable fungal infection, that's that's terrifying to me. Absolutely. And let us not forget the death rate is like 50%, which is crazy high. Like, I don't think people living in this modern age of science and technology and medicine that we live in, people live with HIV and AIDS perfectly long, beautiful lives. But if you have HIV and you come in contact with this fungus, good night. And that mm. is terrifying. That's rough. I do not like I'm that. I'm sad. That's my like, vote. Why am I always trying to get us sad on our death show? Uh, yeah, why Why is the show about death such a bummer? We're just here to vibe and have a good time, man. We need, we need more. This is, why, this is why we need more crab meccas in our life, I think. I think so. So what do you think? Leave it down in the comments. Let us know what is the world's worst way to die from fungus, in your opinion. And let us know what other topics we should cover. What are other world's worst ways to die? The last time we uncovered the world's worst ways to die from water. So go check that out as well if you liked this. Well, Kelsey, this has been a wonderful, terrible, horrible nightmare time. So thank you once again. Absolutely. Thank you, Chris. And I'll be seeing you after the end of The Last of Us. Yes. Stay creepy, fungal people. Hi, I'm Chris. And I'm Kelsey. And this is World's Worst Deaths, the show where we talk about the world's worst ways to die and why exactly those deaths are so horrible. And today's topic is zoonosis. So Kelsey, what is the world's worst way to die from zoonosis? People generally know about zoonotic diseases, even though they might not be familiar with that specific phrase, right? Of the more than 1,400 known human pathogens, over 60% of them are able to jump from animal to human or human to animal. There are bioterrorism diseases that are categorized. Yes, yes. When has that happened? Oh boy. People have tried to weaponize Ebola. People have tried to weaponize the plague. You just like <laughs> pull a bubonic rat its pin and throw it like a grenade. <laughs> I mean, that's actually kind of brilliant. That's the problem with bioterrorism. You really don't know what you're getting into. Is that really a good idea to throw rat grenades of plague at people? I don't think so. I mean, here's one. I bet you didn't know this one before, like, because it sounds so like labby. Anthrax comes from sheep and cows. Because it, it, it's on the ground. It's just around, sitting yes. in the grass, in the dirt. This is a spore forming bacterium. Let's do a shout out really quick. Shout out Salmonella because oh. I'm a cookie dough queen. Are you a cookie dough queen, Chris? I just made brownies last night and about a whole brownies worth of batter I just relished with a spoon. We've had other outbreaks of that, but in previous years, it was really greens and produce where you were finding the salmonella and E. coli. Salads, yeah. Salads, mm -hmm. salads are the devil. Raw egg in cookie dough never did me dirty. Again, wash your damn hands. I don't put cookie dough in my mouth after I handle reptiles. No. We should be afraid of these really common ones because there's a reason why they're so common. We're recording this and it's, you know, spring is starting to come out. Like people will be sending each other chicks and ducklings and playing with little spring animals. Wash your damn hands because these things are so common. That's really sad because I just, saw on TikTok last night that like the reason why we have cats, I'm a cat lady, is that they evolved alongside us and they just liked our vibe and we're like, yeah, we'll hang out with you. But you're telling me that maybe cats have been making us sick from the get go. I think chlamydia. 
did chlamydia come from pigs? I don't know if it came from pigs, but I do know koalas by a large number have chlamydia. <sighs> I don't want to be gross, but it is pretty gross. Like, how do you get chlamydia from a pig or a koala? The, the, the list is very short. The list is short! <laughs> this is an anti-sex with koalas show. Don't do it. Hand-holding only. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> Absolutely. If I had a koala, I would give that little baby a be like, Mwah. And I know that's not, that wasn't cool. It's not cool to kiss animals on the mouth. <laughs> the top Google result of can humans get STDs from pigs? You cannot get species specific diseases from sexual contact. But that's what exactly what we're talking about is that these diseases can evolve and infect other species that they once couldn't infect, which is what makes them so damn near terrifying. Yes, modern examples include bird flu pandemics, swine flu pandemics, of course Ebola pandemics, and all these are enabled by uh, unhygienic practices around livestock, around domesticated animals, around uh, the kinds of uh, animals that are sold on markets. Yes. I think is it Contagion? Where yes. my girl Gwyneth? Gwyneth gets it. And it's like they do this wonderful, like spoiler if you haven't seen this movie from the early 2000s, they do this wonderful device where like at the end of the movie they go back to show you patient zero which was Gwyneth where she like went to a restaurant in like China and the chef was like chopping up bacon or something mm. and then he did one of these and then shook her hand. <laughs> it's one of those professional three second rinses. <laughs> yeah, I really felt strongly that the message of that movie was wash your damn hands. If the message of this video is wash your damn hands. Don't make out with your cat, even though nobody says that that's a way to get a disease, but don't do, don't do what I do. Okay, I'm glad you ad admitted to it because I have a story about my dog and I know that's yeah, not the great way to start experience. the story. <laughs> so a few months ago, I had something gnarly cold, and as I was on the mend, my dog started getting congested, started getting sniffly, started having these little coughs. I was fascinated by the idea of, did I get my dog sick? Did you take him to the vet? Do I need to make some chicken soup <laughs> for my dog? I mean, that would be really scary. The one that really does scare me the absolute most is Ebola, because Ebola is rare, terrifying, and unstoppable. I learned about Ebola because it is one of the most brutal diseases that basically destroys every single function in the human body from top to bottom. So fruit bats are thought to be the normal carrier and are able to spread Ebola without ever being affected by its symptoms, as with many bat, chimpanzee, pig diseases. Ebola symptoms resemble a lot of other really nasty, scary, horrible things that you don't want. It can look like malaria, cholera, typhoid fever, or meningitis. You gotta test the blood. You gotta test the blood. That's not important because you have to test everything to see if you've got it. Once you get Ebola, you're basically riddled with it. It lives in the fluids. In our previous episode, we were talking about how uh, fungal spores can live on after something is dead. Ebola, even though it's a virus, it needs like a live host. It can continue to live on, I suppose, and that is. Ooh, quite that is a lot. eerie. In, in large communities stricken by Ebola, that they will burn the bodies. Is that why they 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 they, they do that? Yes, <laughs> you don't want that thing escaping. Somber note: It's really difficult to you know say goodbye to a loved one who is dying from Ebola because it is so contagious. It's a very sad thing to have to perish from. The hot zone opens with this terrifying scene on an airplane. <laughs> where it describes a, a passenger who begins bleeding from their eyeballs. Bleeding is a big first symptom that typically begins in the first five to seven days of onset of the disease. Infected people show decreased blood clotting, and this can include uh, vomiting blood, coughing up blood, blood in the toilet or in your stool, bleeding into the skin, and especially around needle injection sites. Oh, you know what else? If you just give a quick gander of what, what even is the deal with rabies? Rabies it, is a terrifying virus. It's horrifying. Mm. And there are truly just like nice ass dogs chilling out there, just like walking 
walking around all foamy in the mouth. Oh boy. And they are suffering from inflammation of the brain, paralysis, anxiety, insomnia, confusion, agitation, paranoia, terror, hallucinations. Hydrophobia like, is the weirdest one. Right. You told yes. me about that in the water episode. Yes, that's right. When you're in the later grips of rabies, you are unable to swallow and it makes you really thirsty. And then you start to become afraid of the water that you can't even drink. That's miserable. It is fast moving, so the symptoms prevent so quickly. But what if they present so quickly that like you don't know what's going on? Rabies is like one of those things that we all we all joke about it because it seems like, oh, who's gonna go and get rabies? And these zoonotic illnesses, as far as we know, were not prevalent until we started to domesticate animals en masse. So you're telling me that cave people weren't dealing with like a ton of like illnesses, basically. Like cave people, I mean, they were basically getting killed by like, get, they were getting killed directly by animals. They were yeah, not- Yeah, I would, I would classify getting mauled by a saber toothed tiger as a kind of zoonotic death. If cave people had decided to try and eat saber toothed tigers, they probably would have dealt with a lot more illnesses. But yeah, I think you're right. I think they're mostly getting mauled to death, falling out of trees, getting sucked into tar and then just suffocating to death. But we're not talking about cave people deaths today. But, but zoonotic cavemen as well, I think. Like, if you're living with all these bats, I wonder I wonder how much rabies the bats back then had. I mean, that is actually a fascinating question. Like, the diseases themselves have surely evolved inside their, you know, original breeding grounds. Oh, absolutely. And there have been different eras of viruses evolving alongside mankind and being trapped in time in perma- frost and as the permafrost melts we are reviving these viruses that are frozen in time and we what? we don't have any way to defend our bodies from them with either our own autoimmune systems or with vaccines because they're essentially new viruses okay x-files freaking jurassic park like yes that is nuts and scary. We're truly living in like a super villain's fantasy. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Having gone through collectively COVID-19, the whole world has had to adjust and adapt and then push on as if it didn't happen almost. Something has happened to all of our brains because of it. There's no way we, we, are, we are the same as we were. No, <laughs> and... we about it differently. <laughs> Absolutely. And so I think the next time this happens, and it will happen, I think, on at least this, a similar scale within our lifetimes again, we're going to approach it on, at the onset in, in a new way. And I don't know if we're going to be better off because of it. You are so right about that. Mm -hmm. It's such a trip what you just said. Like every generation, ever so often, we have to deal with a new pathogen because that's just what it is to be a living creature. That's something that we have to biologically evolutionarily cope with. And if we're going to continue domesticating animals, industrializing animals, living alongside them, we're going to have to learn how to adapt with zo zoonotic illnesses. Okay though, but like, have you heard all the hippies and the vegans talking about, we're running out of cows and meat. Like, are we going to have less zoonotic diseases because we are eating cricket burgers in our next generations? Hmm. I know, right? The, the cynical answer is we'll see less bovine-centric diseases and more insect-centric diseases, whatever those may be. I don't know. I don't know that that bugs and humans like can make each other sick necessarily. I will always want to eat meat and I will always want to eat bugs, but I'm not as afraid of diseases from bugs. I think future generations would, me and my scientific theorizing, will probably have less zoonotic disease fear if they're truly moving towards mm, more a bug heavy diet in the future i love that i want to say that you're probably right it feels right Thank i think you. your setup is terrifying but i think your conclusion <laughs> is hopeful and i like that where i landed with the world's worst zoonotic death uh, is a little bit more abstract a little bit out of line with what we typically do on the show but with climate change beyond creating new environments for viruses to thrive in different ways. We're talking about zoonotic illnesses in particular. Climate is going to push on mass 
all these animal populations into different areas where existing animal populations had never interacted with those pathogens before. So we're going to see a wave, an onslaught of brand new zoonotic illnesses that we haven't even seen yet. That is horrifying. I that know. Is horrifying. In 2022, a big study was dedicated to the link between climate change and zoonosis. And it found that as climate change continues to escalate and push animal populations into new areas and interact with those existing animal populations and humans, we will see a spillover of over 15,000 viruses being spread to new hosts and new environments. I can't even wrap my head around that. Like, do they know what the hell these are? Or they're just like, there's like 15,000 brand new pathogens out there. I don't know how no. you land on that number. I imagine just about any animal population, humans included, of course, have their own insular pathogens. And I imagine the longer those populations stay contained amongst themselves, the pathogens evolve within that population. But then once, say, koalas who have a fun koala illness start pushing into human populations more frequently, we start seeing those koala illnesses transfer over to the human populations. And it's the possibility of seeing not just one new unknown disease begin to affect human populations, but an onslaught across the globe, across different environments all at once. And I don't know how we could be properly equipped to handle any of that all at once. So yeah, I know that's a cop out, but over 15,000 new viruses all at once, that's the damn breaking. That, that's sort of the opposite of where you went with this, where we will we'll, we'll get over zoonotic illnesses eventually. I think that will be too much to handle. I think we'll have new dangers and new terrors. There's a lot to be afraid of in the future, but no, like I'm living in the 90s, I'm living in the 20s, 2010s, I'm very afraid of this very specific disease that a 50% average death rate, you know, 25%, 90% of those infected die, mostly due to fluid loss. You heard my description of the fluid loss. Like, you're bleeding out of your eyeballs, you're bleeding into your organs, you're in pain the whole time. You can't see your loved ones because you are so infected. If you're gonna recover, it takes at least two weeks, but that that's because a lot of the time you're, you're gonna perish pretty quickly. And this thing was out there. It was out there in the world. It still is out there. It lives in the lab. It lives in fruit bats. You have to be completely covered head to toe to bury someone. Like I can keep going. It is absolutely terrifying. I think I have my vote for world's worst death from zoonosis. I think it's a slam dunk. My vote for world's worst death from a zoonotic pathogen is absolutely Ebola. Rabies is up there. Absolutely. There's something visceral about just being unable to retain any of your fluids. My palms are sweaty thinking about the bats I used to love are now trying to kill me. Right? Like Ebola is the classic disease. Like everything that we were afraid of pre-COVID was Ebola. She's an icon. She's a legend. She was the moment. Come on now. Virus classic. When in doubt, return to the classics. Well, what do you think? I know that was a lot of information, a lot of our favorite cuddly animals becoming our worst enemies, but there's a lot to choose from. What do you think is the world's worst death from a zoonotic pathogen? Are we right? Are we way off base? Are, are we doctors? I might be a doctor if enough people believe I'm a doctor. Comment <laughs> down below if she's a doctor. This is like a Tinkerbell situation. If you clap, she gets her medical degree. <laughs> I'll become the, the most beautiful best doctor in the world. If you liked this, we did this last time with fungal infections. Click that annotation, please. Well, Kelsey, Dr. Kelsey, maybe Dr. Kelsey, thank you for filling my head with so many new terrible ideas. See you next time.